Welcome to Explore Your Spirit with Kayla. Journey with Kayla as she speaks with researchers, artists, teachers, and healers, delving into topics of ancient mysteries, metaphysical explorations, and new discoveries from science and spiritual arenas. Explore Your Spirit with Kayla can be found online at exploreyourspirit.com. Visit the website for more podcasts, articles, metaphysical news, and upcoming events. Every time you open your mouth, every time you speak, every time you listen to your brother, every time. Welcome to the Explore Your Spirit with Kayla show. I'm your host, Kayla Ambrose. Our next guest this Halloween evening is Brad Steiger, author of Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. Brad, we've had you on the show for Shadow World, uh, Revelations, Strange Guests, and it's wonderful to have you back on again. Oh, it's wonderful to be here, especially on this most auspicious of night. Absolutely. And Brad, vampires are on the rise, as I say. (laughs) And uh, there seems to be more books and TV shows and movies out on vampires than ever before. I'm also noticing that the rules are changing. Now in some books and TV, they go out during the day. Crosses mean nothing to them. And they're even running businesses now. So so what's going on with vampires? Enlighten us. Well, that's why I wrote the book Real vampires. Because I don't know if you've ever seen the old silent film, Kayla, Nosferatu. I absolutely, yes. Love it. Classic. And that's what a real vampire in tradition looks like. You know, like a big rodent with long claws and, and <laughs> almost like a shark's mouth with all those jagged teeth. But now for the last, oh, many years, the vampire has slowly but surely become a sex symbol. So if you would have gone to Nosferatu, or even in 1931, Dracula with Bela Lugosi, you would have heard women screaming. I know my mom told me how women just screamed when Lugosi came out and looked with those eyes. Now if you go watch a showing of Twilight... You'll hear women screaming, but it's not in terror. It's an unbridled teenage lust when (laughs) Robert Pattinson or someone comes out. So we've slowly done that, starting with Bela in 1931 or 1927 when he did it on the stage. When he came out, instead of looking like this rodent, this vermin, when he came out in that sophisticated continental evening dress and cape, when he looked and stared into the camera. From then on, vampires started getting sexier. We know the great Hammer films from from England, when they took over, so to say, the Universal franchise. They couldn't completely because of the copyright laws. But Christopher Lee, again, was a very sensual kind of vampire. And he was surrounded by a very seductive women in, in diaphanous gowns surrounding him. And they were, of course, seducing the men in the movies. So we have had that steady rise where the vampire has 
change, not to a loathsome, disgusting creature, but as someone who with that little bite on the neck promises immortality and never grow old. And, and you can see how that appeals, especially perhaps to young people. It does appeal. I think to women, the reason why the vampire appeals is it has to do with eternal love. Mm -hmm. It's undying love. The vampire, even uh, you'll see like he loved a woman and she died, but 200 years later he finds her again, her new reincarnation, and is still desperately in love with her. And and that women want that romance is really what they're looking for, I think. Yeah, and what I'm saying in Real Vampires, Night Stalkers and Creatures from the Dark Side, is that's not what you get with a real vampire. You don't get that immortality and that everlasting love with that little sensual bite. You get only a very painful death. Well, let's talk about that. Let's debunk uh, uh, vampires as they're written about in, in fictional movies and books and uh, vampires as you, as you understand them to be. Explain that for us, Brad. Well, first of all, I don't want to debunk. I want people to have their fun. You know, if if they enjoy the vampire, I just want them to understand what the creature really is. And I think it's a real creature. I think it's been around since ancient times. I think it is an entity that is a parasitic, shape-shifting being that feeds upon the energy, the life force, and the souls of humans. And we have accounts of the vampire going all the way back to ancient Babylon, to Egypt. We had the entity Lilith in Babylon, who then, when she goes with the Hebrews after the Babylonian captivity, becomes Lilith. And is what's said to be the wife of Adam, and thereby their union created all these creatures, these succubi and the incubi, the incubi that molest women, succubi that go after men and little babies. So we have this tradition. Now, if you want to call them fallen angels, that would be fine. If you want to call them the Nephilim, the Jinn, the Kakodemons, the Rakshas, every faith has them. But I focus primarily on the Abrahamic religions in the book because I think the majority of readers will be uh, Christians, Jews, and, and Muslims. So the Abrahamic religions certainly have the concept of the entities that defy the supreme being, the entities that rebel and say, we're, we're not going to. I mean, you think... This hairless ape is special. So we have Satan, we have Iblis in the Quran saying, no, no way. And they really make it their mission to torment humans or to take their blood. But then there becomes a strange kind of bartering that takes place with the Nephilim and the humans. The Nephilim teach the men warfare out-of-fashion weapons. They teach the women how to make jewelry, how to weave. So there were some that thought, you know, these, these guys are all right. We will sacrifice a human to them every now and then because they seem to really like our blood. And then after, in all the, the religious faiths, including now, we will include the Hindu and the Shinto and all the others, as well as the Abrahamic religions, discuss this great warfare that took place. And in Worlds Before Our Own, the earlier book of mine, I recount hundreds of sites around the planet that look as though nuclear blasts have taken place. There are forts. There are cities found deep in the jungles in which the stones have been vitrified with a great heat. Now, we know this couldn't have happened by piling logs on the stone fort. So some great energy, and it appears, as the ancient scriptures all agree, some 
great warfare took place. Well, what was the object of the warfare? The human soul. So now these negative vampiric entities have left the earth to retreat to what I would prefer calling another dimension. They return to earth as paraphysical beings. They can assume human form, but they really prefer seizing upon a host body, one of us, a human. And that's why someone may be guilty of horrible crimes when he's apprehended the parasite leaves and the person is left there saying, what did I do? What did I do? And he may not have any memory of the crime he committed. So we have these parasites that at one time perhaps walked the world out like gods. Uh, we were doing blood sacrifices uh, to bring them around for, right. for different reasons. Where we are, are we with that today? There's oh, so much talk oh, about like uh, gods and goddesses from ancient Egypt and other times mm-hmm. that they kind of dissipated because people stopped uh, paying attention to them like a thought form. If you don't give much thought to something, it dissipates. So uh, is, is it similar now? Have they dissipated? Or because we give so much thought to them now, are we uh, bringing them back or making them stronger? Well, I think we're making them stronger. We, um, even the fun games that we play, the, uh, when we go to the movies and we have fun and we dress up on Halloween, put the fangs in and so forth, That's keeping the myth alive and treating it very lightly. As I say, I'm not trying to rain on anyone's parade here. But the demons or the fallen angels, or what I prefer to call spirit parasites, are still here, and people try to bring them back in the same way. That's why I have the chapter on the blood cult. There are still people doing sacrifices of animals and still doing sacrifices of humans. In ancient times, the human sacrifice was, of course, de rigueur. I mean, it was extremely common because the people knew that these creatures liked our blood. So if they sacrificed one of their fellows, one of their community, they felt and hoped that that would lure them back. So we do the same thing today with the serial killers, the mass murderers. How often have those who have killed even members of the family professed little knowledge or didn't know what they were doing? But they had allowed the creature in. And there's kind of one, there aren't many universal metaphysical laws, I don't think, but one of them is these creatures cannot invade you unless you permit it. And we have that classic scene in some of the vampire movies where he has to be invited in. Well, we can invite them in by more than just knock, knock on the door. We invite them in with anger, Envy, jealousy, greed, arrogance, lies, and certainly when we overindulge in recreational drugs or alcohol, whenever we become vulnerable, when we let our guard down, when we let something possess us, I think it's interesting that all the drugs, all the alcohol, They have their own names, don't they? I think there's something on some level people understand that that's John Barleycorn or that's Mary Jane or that's whatever for marijuana or for alcohol. They all have a name. And I think this is a personification of the knowledge, at least unconscious knowledge, of inviting the spirit parasite in. It's fascinating to me throughout culture, if we look at it historically, too, that vampires seem to to rise up for a while in popularity and then they'll drift down and come back up. There's a movie, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think it was in the 60s and uh, it was based in Europe. Uh, the vampire went to 
uh, to the home of someone, I think they were in Italy, and live, uh, was was looking for a bride, and they were trying to get him to marry one of the daughters because they were uh, a proud people with a lot of money who had lost their money and were still trying to live like they were wealthy. And really, it wasn't a vampire movie. It was about uh, the feudal system and the caste system, and the peasant is the one who's actually uh, being with being with the daughters, so they're not virginal, and there's a whole... I, I, I'm sure our listeners, someone will write in and tell me what the name of this movie is. But the whole point of that was to show that difference there in um, aristocracy and, and the death of that. And we see the vampire come back so many different times. Um, and obviously we're talking about uh, two different things here. We're talking about one, about the, the spirit of it that we can bring in, and then the other, how we use it in society. But I was right. wondering about that, Brad. When you see it go up and down like that, what do you think that's saying about society when they're more drawn to the vampire-type story? Well, I think now, and you as a, a mother, and as someone who deals with young people, you have probably felt the same dismay that I have When you see the surveys of how dismal youth look at our the possibility of the future, how despondent they are, how many forget about a goal of college, how many the dropout rate from high school has never been higher, Mm -hmm. and so many of them say, "Why? Why bother?" Look at global warming. It's not going to be a world. There's not going to be. And look at the economy. I can't get a job if I do go to college. So here we have, once again, the lure, of the escapism of, as you said before, this romantic figure. We, we don't have to work if we're dead, but we're also the undead. We are still walking. We are still buff. We are still attractive. We are still young. So it's the escapism, the romanticism of something. And as you said, you and I would, and most people, I hope, would rather know there's an angel guide looking over them. But in the romantic sense, these people, these young people who are going to the dentist and having fangs put in, they like to think a vampire is looking over them the way the vampire looks over the heroine in the Twilight series. The way so often, the, the one the Moonlight, the series that was on last year, where the private detective had saved the girl when she was just a child and still looks after her, is still there as her guard. But now, of course, she's grown. So there's an attraction between them. So, again, it it is ancient. It repeats itself. Here we have the God we can fall in love with. And we forget that same God can also betray us and possess us and have us do their unholy bidding. So it's the search for immortality and a God that promises it, but without the weight, basically. You can have it now. Without the weight, without the work. And this romantic, as I say, it began in 1931 with Bela. It slowly progressed. In the Dracula movies of, as we say, the the U.K., those movies with Christopher Lee. He was always dealt with after he had wreaked havage. So in those movies, he is exposed as evil, even though he is very seductive and bites on the neck and and bloods the creature, just as in the classic Dracula. But we have left that part out the vampire lover is not slain anymore he remains as this romantic figure and i think that's where the transfer and of course we still have in 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 some of the um, presentations where there are the bad vampires and the good vampires and that's what's really amused me 
as an individual who's been studying this subject for 60 years now. <clears throat> and it was the same with the werewolf. You might remember the big werewolf encyclopedia that I did. Yes. Uh-huh. How the werewolf has been converted. And there's game playing. People dress up as vampires and werewolves. Now, now that's one thing I want to qualify because I have some pretty gory chapters in the book, but I'm not including the subculture that we have of the contemporary vampire community. I'm not talking about them. They're people who kind of like to have Halloween every day of the year. And I'm I'm with that. I mean, uh, Halloween and, and uh, Christmas tie for my, my favorite holiday. They are harming no one. They have their vampire nightclubs, which I'm sure you're aware of. They have, Not that I'm saying you attend, but I'm sure you're aware of. <laughs> you might attend. I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, these people are primarily... Psychic vampires, they exchange energy, and some of them are sanguinarians. They will cut maybe uh, never on the throat because that's dangerous, but maybe the the wrist or the shoulder or someplace, and they will lap a little blood from each other, but very little because, as you know, if if you drink human blood, you die. We, we cannot we cannot consume human blood. Animal blood, and animals can consume ours, but we cannot drink human blood. So therefore, the people who are trying that route, and I have some in the book who are taking just enough so that they're horribly mutilating their victims, they are not the vampire community. The vampire community, the sincere members will be the first to tell you, if you're looking for someone who kills because he must have human blood, then you're looking for a psychopath. You're looking for a psychotic individual. You're not looking for one of us. And they were extremely helpful. You know, there's there are no secrets on the Internet. So word got around that I was doing this big book on vampires. So I received an email from a leader of the vampire community saying, is there anything I can do to help? Which, of course, I translated immediately as, what are you going to write about us? And I assured him that, no, no, I, I would not include them with the serial killers, with the murderers, with those who are downright nasty, horrible individuals. And I received full cooperation. They even gave me their extensive survey an extensive, detailed survey of the contemporary vampire community. So that's in the book, too. The people who, what shall we say, they're so in love with this style, this lifestyle. And I think before people are shocked, let's kind of make an analogy of the Civil War enactors who are trying to get uniforms precisely correct, authentic, accurate, get their firearms exactly correct, fire the muzzle loaders, have the cannons going boom, and they're still reenacting the war between the states. No one could drive by and say, those guys are, are nuts. Those guys are crazy. The the Civil War has been long over. But then there are others. Teachers bring their students. Parents bring their children. Because they're being historically accurate. And they are enacting certain battles. So the vampire community is enacting their idea of a vampire, which, of course, is almost completely taken from the more romantic movies. Which is human nature. We all seek to understand ourselves at a greater level. And for many people, role-playing or immersing themselves in a a type of situation helps them to understand it and themselves deeper. Right. Exactly. Getting back to your book, Brad, I, I want to read a paragraph here and ask you about it. 
The Sacred Magic of Abramlin the Mage, translated by McGregor Mathers from a manuscript written in French in the 18th century, is dated 1458 and claims to be translated originally from Hebrew. The text states that the universe is teeming with hordes of angels and demons that interact with human beings on many levels. Humans are somewhere between the angelic and the demonic intelligences on the spiritual scale, and each human entity has both a guardian angel and a malevolent demon hovering near him or her from birth until death. Let's talk about that. There's duality in this universe. There's mm-hmm. as above, so below, as within, so without. There's spring and, and fall, summer and winter, sun and moon. So here again, we have the duality. If there's an angel, there's a demon. So explain that for us. Go into that a little bit, if you could, and, and how this could relate with the vampire, uh, the energy back that you were talking about. Well, I I believe, as Abraham the Magi, what I I think needs to be brought out here is and and I know Kayla that you're an expert on on the ancient truths and the ancient ways and I know that you're dealing with them in you know a, a very sacred and respectful manner. Thank you. I think we have to look at many of the alchemists who they're what they were really trying to do and if you read uh, truly read the the text They are seeking to control angels, angels to do their bidding. And people are still doing that today. You can buy books on have your angel do this, have your angel do that, have your angel, you know, it sounds like the angel can win the lottery for you. These books were use your angels. Well, that's not the way it works, and I, I, I think you totally agree with me. Yes, That's, thank you for saying that. I get really tired of hearing that, how angels are just for people's, uh, people's beck and call to do whatever, whenever. Exactly. So the alchemists started, many of the alchemists had as that goal. Now, you see, this goes way back to what we were talking before, because the ancient the, the Nephilim were the ones who taught magic. They were the ones who taught jewelry making. They were the ones who taught finding gold. So again, bring that up to the Middle Ages and the people who were truly informed of the ancient negative truths, if you want to put it that way, said, I got to get me an angel. And so they were doing so many things to lure an angel. Well, you know what happens Surely that might appear to be a grand and glorious angel. And perhaps some of the things you ask will be granted. But that's all a snare. That's all setting up a trap to lure you in. Because any angel who's going to pretend to obey a human is a fallen angel who has its own agenda. And that agenda is seizing your spirit, your energy. I'm not saying taking your soul forever, but certainly taking the soul energy and stealing you of your right to be an independent entity, to have freedom of will, to have freedom of choice. It's gone, and you become a slave to that being. Well, I'm saying that those true Uh, Excuse me, those also are true vampires. Those are real vampires. And they've been with us, tricking us, ensnaring us for centuries. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back more with Brad Steiger, discussing more about real vampires, night stalkers, and creatures from the dark side. We'll be right back with more of Explore Your Spirit with Kayla. Hi, this is Kayla. Now more than ever, it's important to watch how you spend your money and to take good care of your home. As we move into this age of awareness, our thoughts turn to how we can care for the earth and ourselves, going green and creating a home filled with beauty, harmony, and natural products. Creative Tile by Scott Correa brings custom tile work to your home or office. Don't spend another day breathing in toxins from carpet or linoleum. 
Creative Tile installs natural tile, bamboo, marble, granite, and stone. Call Scott today at 508-971-5228 for your estimate. Creative Tile by Scott Korea, proudly serving clients since 1981 from the Northeast to Texas. Call 508-971-5228. That's 508-971-5228. Hi, this is Kayla. Many of you know me as the host of the Explore Your Spirit with Kayla show. I'm also an author and esoteric wisdom teacher. My book, Nine Life-Altering Lessons, Secrets of the Mystery Schools Unveiled, gives an inside look to what it's like to enter a mystery school or temple and study the ancient teachings of Egypt. Many who've enjoyed my book have asked for a more interactive experience to help them on their journey. In answer to this request, I've created a three-part series of guided meditations designed to illuminate the soul, awaken the mind, and guide you within on a wondrous journey. Each meditation uses beautiful natural settings, offering the opportunity to interact with guides and other beings of light throughout each journey. The series begins with the Spirit of Hawaii. The next CD is the Egyptian Mystery Temple, and the third is the Tibetan Mountain Journey. Carefully crafted, these uplifting and empowering meditations allow beginners to revel in the joy of meditation with a guide, while more experienced meditation practitioners will enjoy peeling back the many layers of this work, which allow for new experiences each time the meditation is played. These meditations are available on iTunes or audible.com. Enjoy. This is Kayla, and you're listening to Beautiful Life by Carrie Cole, which is also the song you heard at the beginning of the Explore Your Spirit show. Beautiful Life is a song on Carrie's album, Circle of Fire. For more information, visit CarrieCole.com. Every time you open your mouth, every time you speak, every time to your brother every time you are weak every time you talk to the children every time you wonder why every time you think you are lost every time you want to cry Hi, this is Kayla, and I'm inviting you to come be a part of the Explore Your Spirit community. Sign up for our free monthly talk show guide and be the first to know what new guests are coming to the show. In addition, visit our new Explore Your Spirit Bohemian blog and see what guest bloggers have to say. It's here all on ExploreYourSpirit.com. Hi, this is Kayla, and you're listening to the song Weather Van by Mary McBride off her CD by any other name. Download these songs and others at reality-entertainment.com. Picture so blurry it can't be framed. Heart so full it can't feel pain. Shifty pair of eyes at ambush hour. 19 volts of water rushing power. Tunnel underneath the leaning tower and grenades disguised by flowers.
Spirit with Kayla. We're back from our break, speaking more with Brad Steiger uh, about his book. And Brad, we've had you on the show several times. It's a goal of mine to try to get you to talk about every book you've ever written, if uh, if we can last that long and, and keep going, because there'd be so many. Last time I checked, I think you were at like 170 or 180. I can't even remember now. It's in the numbers. It's amazing. Um, oh, thank you. And th- this book, the cover, okay, it's scary. But at least it's not as scary to me as Strange Guest. That's still the cover. I just can't even <laughs> look at. And that show scared me so bad talking to you, Brad, on everything there. And that that if you haven't seen Brad's books, you need to go to his website. And, and Brad, let's give that out. Is it bradandsherry.com? That's it. Okay. And, 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 and Sherry with the Y. Uh, H-E-R-R-Y. Right. So many people like to put an I in there. Yeah, bradandsherry.com. And go look at all of Brad's books and, and the covers. And you have to check out Strange Guests and email me if you look at it. Tell me if that's not the scariest cover you've ever seen. But this one's pretty scary up there, too, right, with the, with the real vampires. Well, I'm delighted with the art that I have yes. in the book. and. And I, I'm so pleased. Now the cover and much of the art is done by Ricardo Pustanio, who is kind of uh, Mr. Mardi Gras. I call him the King of New Orleans. Oh, nice! That's he, my neck uh, of the woods. He, he's busy right now already. He designs a good many of the floats that are in the Mardi Gras. He designs all the decorations for the Mardi Gras ball. And he's just tremendous artist, and, and he has contributed so many people say, well, where did you get these? Where did... And then other artists, Bill Oliver, my uh, buddy from Vancouver, and uh, Wolfman, Wolfman Dan Allen, uh, <laughs> is one of, uh, you can, of course, Dan and I became friends after the werewolf book, and... Um, I am adopted Wolf Clan Seneca, Aww. and keep uh, in touch. Uh, there are uh, there are many many wolves among us, including myself, but not werewolves, <laughs> but simply those who are members of the Wolf Clan and respect the wolf for its wisdom, its guidance. For the Native Americans, the wolf is Mother Wolf, the great teacher, and that's the that's the. Um, the motto and the spirit that we follow. At any rate, these very fine artists uh, have contributed this work. Uh, again, it's, it's reached that time of my life, Kayla, where these fellows had all read my books when they were kids or teenagers and said, gee, I would love to do art for your new book. Mm. These guys are all pros, you know, commanding uh, high high prices for their work. And I said I would love it. So it's a reciprocity. Uh, some of them, one of them was kind enough to say that he's come full circle from reading the books to appearing in one of my books. And uh, it's just, there, there's no way for an author to really express that. And, again, so many have written in to say, you know, that they've been reading the books since they were 10 or 11 or whatever, and, and, they're, and they're grandparents now. So, to me, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. It's just touching people. It's You definitely do. You definitely have with your career and so many of your wonderful books. And you and Sherry write some together, too, and just cover so many different interesting topics. And it is a great gift, that what you give here with your writings. and. I'm glad to see that so many people are connecting that way, and the illustrations are wonderful in the book. You mentioned New Orleans about the one illustrator, and I'm from Louisiana. That's that's my uh, neck of the woods, as we say. Really? And, uh, you know, talking about vampires, there's only one time where I really felt the presence, where I felt that there was something vampiric around me, and that was actually in New Orleans one night when I was out on, on a carriage ride and uh, felt the presence of something uh we were it was one of those carriage rides and you go through the old old right. section and it was way down at the other end of the street but it might as well have been right there next to me it was very scary that's interesting because the i had just uh, someone had sent me an article uh, of a new vampire 
nightclub had opened in, in the section uh, of, of uh, New Orleans. But long before it was a vampire nightclub, and there's an account in the book of the young man, and, and then uh, after he had written to me, his, his uh, girlfriend who accompanied him also wrote the account. And it's a fascinating account of they were just kind of on the town one night, and they truly believed that they ran into a real vampire. Oh, I think I read that. They were in Tampa in Ybor City, where I've lived exactly. before. Mm-hmm. Ybor City, yeah. and that's where this new club... But it wasn't a vampire nightclub then. It was just a night spot in Ybor City. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's a very scary story. And the interesting thing is he later developed... Uh, a blood disease, and the vampire, the invisible voice around him said, you are spared you know, because of your blood. And he thought, well, what does that mean? I am also a vampire or whatever. And he found out, as, as you know from reading the book, that later he had something that, you know, it's cleared up now, thank, thank the Lord, but, but he, that may have spared him. from. So I suppose anyone who knows my previous work knows that primarily I am taking the supernatural approach when I say real vampires. I say that these are entities that can possess, that can manifest, that are really paraphysical beings that can invade our reality, our dimension. Going back to that experience in my line of work and being intuitive, I've definitely uh, picked up on different energies of different things over my lifetime. And it's interesting because the, that time was completely different than anything else that I've ever felt. I can't say for certain that that's what it was, but I don't know why, but that's what I felt at that time that it was. But what what did you feel? Did you feel like you were being stalked or did you feel like... Uh... No, I felt just cold and dread running down me, just mm-hmm. like loss of of, of hope of anything positive, just a cold dread dripping over me and making me feel uh, confused and uh, disoriented. You know, that's exactly, that's exactly. Boy, you were very fortunate that you have the light around you. I agree. And that you preach and practice the light because uh, that, that is exactly the way people describe the Malay, the the feeling, the the loss of energy, the the helplessness. The, I mean, you you just pegged it exactly. It, uh, I was in a carriage at the time, and uh, it, as that was happening, the horse went wild, and and um, the man was trying to control the horse, and uh, the horse kind of bolted, and so I think that that helped as well. <laughs> now you well know, workers in the light, <laughs> you know there. They're prime uh, targets. They're, they're, they're at the top of the target list. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I've dealt with, you know, I'm not, I'm no stranger to that, and I'm, I'm not a, a fearful person, and I definitely have dealt with, with other things. Let's say, uh, and so kind of, I don't want to say I have a notebook, but I certainly have some notes on uh, what different experiences feel like, and and this one was completely different. Uh, in that way. And growing up in Louisiana, I'm no stranger to ghosts and ghost stories and right. uh, other types of things. And But but it was interesting, too, in your book, like Tampa and Ybor City, that's such an old section of town, mm-hmm. a lot of history there, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of powerful emotions from all that history. And we seem to find this a lot when uh, going with the paranormal, whether it's looking for ghosts, whether it's with entities, they seem to be drawn to the old harbors, the old ports, the old places where emotions have run high, lots of Absolutely. things have come through. It seems to to hold that. I guess maybe uh, there's a combination there that perhaps they're not the psychic vampires that we talk about where people that kind of feed off energy, but perhaps there's a resulting emotion energy that they can feed off of uh, while, while they're waiting for the next victim, I guess, in a way. Yeah, I, th- I think you have uh, described it exactly right. Now, the the Night Stalkers, because this isn't just com- you know a book entirely about vampires, and the Black Eyed Boys has been a chapter that people have really responded to, the Lost Boys. Mm-hmm. Had you encountered those before? No, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> no, I, I, 
I, I should have said stories. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yes, I have stories. <laughs> yeah. But these follow a strange modus operandi. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you've done the same as I have, you know, trying to determine their agenda. And they may be vampires, or they may, I think they're probably more in the psychic vampire line. So I'll just describe a little bit, and then perhaps you can share an encounter that has been reported to you. That'd be great, yeah. Of these boys that just appear on your front door and ask, you know, can we please come in? I mean, just to use the phone or... They're all probably about 17, 15, and then there's probably one, maybe nine or ten, kind of preteen. And then if, if that doesn't work, they say, well, you know, he really has to use your bathroom. Can you just use your bathroom? Just for, we'll just be in. We won't bother you. And woe be to those who do open the door. And you can see, especially women, they see this poor little boy, this little waif, you know, and he's Obviously, has to go to the bathroom. Oh, come on, George, let's let him in. Most of the people, thankfully, <laughs> don't fall for it. And they will open the door just a few minutes after they think they're gone, and they're absolutely nowhere in sight. Now, I begin receiving accounts of these black-eyed boys, oh, maybe eight, nine years ago. And the first account which I place in the book, I, I still think is, is one of the eeriest. That's where two couples are out, double dating, and these boys appear as, as they're leaving um, kind of a park area, and they wave. One of the boys waves, and uh, one of the girls says, well, who is that? And the narrator, let's say, who told me the story, said, I don't know. I don't know who they are. As they got closer, he said, Let, let's go, let's go. And he pulls out really fast. They say, what? You know, he's coming over to talk to you. He says, I don't want, didn't you see their eyes? They have totally black eyes. What are they? Who are they? And one of the girls says, oh, come on. You know, it's just those little round sunglasses that cover the eyes. Well, they go get something to eat. When they come out, another side of town. But there are the boys waiting for them sitting across the street, waving at him. What is this? One of the girls thinks, you know, are, are you, you know, you're just trying to scare us, you're setting up. No, no, I really don't know. So they said, well, let's go to a movie. There's a movie they, they'd all been wanting to see. So they come out after the cinema, and there are those same boys sitting <laughs> Leaning against the car, not too far from their own. I say, now this is this is really getting too much. And one of the girls keep insisting, you you just you're you're setting us up. You know, what kind of joke is this? No, how do they know where we are? So then he says, well, this is new night spot, way on the edge of town. You know, if if someone's following us, if they're following us somehow. Because every time they leave, he, he tells his, his male friend, you know, are they following us? There's no one following us, but yet there they are. So they go to this night spot on the edge of town. They're in there for a couple hours, still almost closing. They come out, and there they are again, these boys. And that got to be too much for the one couple. So the, the narrator and his fiance return to their apartment. They happen to be in the bottom floor, next to the big stoop, the big cement steps out front. They're not home more than a few minutes, and there's a knock at the door. He looks out through the peephole, and there are the boys on their front step. And again saying, can we come in just for a minute? Please, please. You know, we, we're cold. No, I'm not going to let you in. Well, Got to use the bathroom. No way. You know, find find someplace else. Well, it, can we just use the phone? And we call for someone to pick us up. And he says, you know, you've been doing very well getting around the city tonight. You, I, I, I don't know. And just 
his, in the meantime, his fiance has called the police. And when the boys hear the siren, they seem literally just to disappear. And he runs out, he looks down, the street is very well lighted, they're nowhere in sight. Now this is kind of the formula for how these entities prey upon people. Or I say, what, what is their agenda? Are they psychic vampires? Are they true vampires? The people who've let them in had to f- have had to flee from their home. And when they do come back with the police, their home is just shredded. I mean, it's just torn up. It's just smashed. So uh, are they incredibly ornery, spiritual <laughs> vandals? What are they? But it, it's a chapter uh, a lot of people said, you know, creep them out as much as the vampire chapters. Definitely. Um, I, I think it's, I've the stories I've heard, that it's always a malevolent being that really isn't a child. It takes the form of the child just to get in. Mm-hmm. And then once you let it in, good luck getting it out. That's right. Uh, and just something that you don't want to deal with uh, <laughs> in any way, because they prove to be, a, from, what I under, from, what I, from what I've heard, very difficult to get rid of. Even oh, though, impossible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and hopefully they would just stick with the house instead of following the person. Right, um, right. And, but that's also a danger, I think, of that they attach themselves to the individuals. Yes. But l- fortunately, the majority, the great majority of cases, the people just <laughs> haven't let them in. I think if if it were one boy, you know, they, they might let this little boy in. But it's usually three or four and I think that's what causes people, you know, thankfully, to refuse to let to uh, give them admission into their homes. Because, as we said earlier, there is that kind of one universal dictum is you have to invite them in. And as we said, you can invite them in by, by a number of ways, greed and lust and jealousy and so forth. Any of the human weaknesses open you up and make you more vulnerable. But this is, I think, an unusual one. And I dealt, you remember when we talked about Shadow World with the spirit mimics? Yes, yes. I just had to put them in again because I think they are so incredibly fascinating. Fascinating and informative. Uh, I, these things do happen. There are people with stories. Thankfully, they're not a common occurrence every day. But uh, people need to know about these things. And you you need to think twice before you answer that door sometimes. That's right. And as you were talking about how we can do things to let it in, I teach something very similar about our aura. And you can create a, a brittle aura or a broken aura with uh, emotions that you're doing, whether it's anger or depression or uh, different emotions that can weaken your auric field and uh, allows things to penetrate and affect you in the same way. It's important to to care for your spiritual body as well as other bodies. Absolutely. And, and I, I know you do that, and, and uh, I, I wish more people did, and I, I hope you know that people are paying attention when you talk about that, because that that is so true, and, and that's what we're talking about, really, spiritual beings that are paraphysical, that are basically non-physical that can become physical or or invade a host body. So what you've just mentioned is exactly the barrier that they penetrate. They have to penetrate that aura first before they can get in the body. Yes. So it's good to, to keep that healthy as well. And Brad, we've reached the end of another fascinating show with you so quickly. Oh, my goodness. I, I have two questions for you before we go. One, uh, do you celebrate Halloween? And if so, are you going to dress up? And what's your costume going to be? <laughs> well, I always loved Halloween when I was a kid, believe it or not. Of course, I come from a little country town. I would paint the windows of every merchant in town with Dracula, Wolfman, the Mummy, <laughs> aliens. I loved doing it as a kid. I loved dressing up. But now my Halloweens are spent doing Halloween broadcasts. <laughs> but we, so we, we don't dress up or we don't. One of these years, I, I 
Square, we're going to have a massive Halloween party. We'll, we'll be sure to invite you. Wonderful. Well, um, I usually come as a witch, but my husband says that the costume doesn't look much different than other days. Oh, <laughs> shame on him. <laughs> no, it's been wonderful, Brad, as always, having you on the show. And be careful who you open the door to. And uh, we'll have to have you back again, as always, and love to have Sherry with you sometime, too. I'd love to that talk about your great. Angels book. Great. Yeah. And, and by the way, I think the best vampire film I've seen in many, many years is called that. It's a Swedish film. Uh, be careful who you open the door. And it's about a little girl who's mm. a vampire who goes from century to century to century. That's and, awesome. and I think it's one of the best vampires and most accurate uh, vampire movies I've seen. I, I'll have to look that one up. I'm trying to remember, hopefully, one of our uh, listeners here will write in and tell me about that movie I'm thinking about from the 60s, too. Cause <laughs> well, that, that could be many I, I, that run through my mind, but uh, yes, let me know, too. I will, definitely. Thanks so much for your time, Brad. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Kayla. Many blessings. Explore Your Spirit is on the web. Visit us at exploreyourspirit.com.